So I have a question for you. Have you ever felt like someone had an expectation of you, but you did not know how to fulfill that expectation? It wasn't even that you didn't feel like you were capable of fulfilling it. You didn't even know how to fulfill it. Well, this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about maybe some expectations or something that you feel like might be a need that God has from you, but you may not know how to accomplish that. Last week, if you weren't here last week, Ryan started the sermon series with an 80s movie, so I thought, well, I'm going to start with an 80s movie. But my, my movies are a little different. He, I don't think he realized 25 years ago that who he was marrying because I love sports. I love watching sports. I told him the other day, I was like, well, it's, it's cornhole championship time because there's nothing else on um, ESPN. I, I love baseball in person. Watching baseball on TV is, is kind of like watching golf on TV. But what he didn't expect was the fact that one of the shows or one of the stations that I love the most is this little station with these three little letters called PBS. He walked in one day and I was watching Antique Roadshow and he said, you're a nerd. (laughs) But growing up in Maine, there was a, a series that came on PBS that I absolutely loved. I had read all the books and growing up in Maine, uh, we're, I was very close to the Canadian border, and so there in Nova Scotia and um, throughout that area, there was a book series called Anne of Green Gables, and I loved those books, and then about, or I think it was around like 1982, PBS came out with another remake of the Anne of Green Gables series. I know, I think Netflix came out with one too. The best is PBS, 1985, so y'all need to go back and watch that one. But I loved this story of Anne of Green Gables. And one of the things that I loved about Anne was she was just very real, very honest. I also loved that she had red hair. I prayed for a redhead, got my own little redhead over here that saying this morning. But she was very real. Even in the, throughout the character in the book, there was a, a lot of genuineness about her. And so if you don't know the story, Anne was an orphan, and she went and she lived with different family members, I mean, with different families, and grew up kind of not in a foster system, but being passed from one family to the next. And she found herself at this place called Green Gables. And Marilla, someone, a woman that had never been married, lived with her brother, decided to take in what she thought was going to be a 13-year-old boy, but it ended up being this 13-year-old, red-headed, quick-witted little girl. And in that moment while she was learning a little bit about Green Gables, she realized that there was some structure and some things that she needed, some expectations that she needed to have. And one of those was to say her evening prayers. And so Marilla came into the room and, and she asked Anne, have you said your prayers? And, and Anne said, well, no, the family I was with before told me that God made my hair red on purpose and I haven't cared for him since. <laughs> and she said, well, if you're going to be in this house, you're going to say your evening prayers. And so Anne looked at Marilla and said, absolutely, how do I do that? And so Marilla said, well, get by the bed and kneel down and close your eyes. And so Anne got over by the edge of the bed and knelt down and closed her eyes. And then she asked Marilla, what do I say? And this was Marilla's response. Marilla said, well, just thank God for his blessings and humbly ask what you want. The simplicity of that answer Thank God for his blessings and humbly ask him for what you want. There was an expectation that was on Anne to stay in this house, was to say her prayers, but she didn't know how to even accomplish that. She had never been taught how to pray. 
And the simplicity of the answer was, thank God for his blessings and then humbly ask him what you want. So I have a question for you. How did you learn how to pray? Was it a, a grandmother or a grandfather by your bedside at night or a, a mother or a father that taught you how to pray? Maybe it was a Sunday, oh, excuse me. We're gonna cut that out of the, maybe it was a Sunday school teacher that taught you how to pray. Or maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've never been taught how to pray. That you understand that there's an expectation as a follower of Christ to have some sort of communication with your heavenly father, but you don't even know how to begin. Today is the day for you. This morning, we are in week five of our sermon series, Summer on the Mount. I love this series because Jesus' sermon here is so relatable and so practical for each of us in our everyday life. For those of you, if you've ever heard or ever thought, well, the Bible was for 2,000 years ago, was for thousands of years ago, it's not for me today. Can I tell you that this sermon, this message, these few chapters in the middle of a gospel is so relevant and so applicable for us today. The first week we talked about the kingdom of God and the ethics that go along with it. See, Jesus, as he was preaching, he was preaching kingdom principles. And you may think, well, what are kingdom principles? Kingdom principles are the things that, the principles that we live by in the kingdom of God that are completely different than the principles we live by in this earthly world. Anything that you would think, well, that's how we do it down here, it's totally different up there. And so the first week, we learned about kingdom ethics. The second week, the kingdom purpose. Week three, we, we heard Jesus talking about kingdom relationships. And last week, Ryan shared about kingdom finances. Well, this week, we are talking about kingdom conversations, so go ahead, grab your Bibles, your smartphones, open up to Matthew chapter 6. I've entitled today's message, Prayer Made Easy. It's easy. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, and we ask that you open up your word to us, that the expectations and the thoughts that we have towards prayer, that today you will simplify them. And Lord, I ask that you would give us a hunger to pray, a desire to have conversation with you, that Lord, today would spark something inside of us to learn more about you and to desire to speak directly to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we've talked about the Sermon on the Mount, and I, and I love uh, the picture that's painted here. You have Jesus looking over a crowd of people, and, and he begins to teach. And as he begins to teach, he starts to tell his followers about prayer. They had seen prayer whether they were pagans, whether they had, you know, grown up in a, in a Jewish faith or they had grown up in um, a, a, a faith that belonged in that era and that time, they saw prayer. Prayer happened in temples. Prayer happened um, throughout the culture. No matter what religious background they had, they saw prayer. They saw places of prayer. And so Jesus brings his followers together and says, this is how you pray. In verse five, he says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. That word hypocrite there means an actor, right? It's, it's, they're playing a part. So Jesus says, when you pray, don't just play a part. 
The hypocrites, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Jesus isn't saying, don't pray in the synagogues. Don't pray on the street corners. But when you pray, don't pray like them. That all they're doing, the reason why they're there is so they can be seen. Jesus said instead in verse 6, he says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Yeah, I asked you before how you learned how to pray. I I got saved when I was five years old. I said I grew up in Maine. My father, uh, I I like to say he was a pastor, but he keeps coming out of retirement and taking more churches. We're like, okay, Dad, it's time for somebody else. But he won't ever fully retire, so he is a pastor. And um, I learned how to pray through them through my mom and through my dad. When we were 14 years old, he took a church in Clearwater, Florida. We moved down here. And, and um, what I remember is at 14, I would walk into um, the auditorium, into the sanctuary, and I would look at the altar area, and there was a path. Um, it was literally a path in the carpet that was worn down. And what I found out was at 6 a.m., my dad was a morning person. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to pray at 6 a.m. Your prayer at 6 a.m. can be, Lord, help me for the rest of this day. (laughs) But my dad was a morning person. And so at 6 a.m., he would go into the church alone. And he would begin to walk the altar and pray. And he prayed so much that he wore a path in the altar of the church. He would turn. I, I, I love, I would love, I, when I got older, I started going with him in the mornings and he would walk and he would turn on the balls of his toe, right on the top of his toe. And he literally wore a circle from where his foot would turn on each end. He would intercede and he would pray for us, his family, his church, his nation. I got to watch him pray. I would go into my mother's room and I would see her on the floor with her Bible open and just crying out to God for her children and and for her, her church. And I got to watch them pray. But can I tell you, that didn't teach me how to pray. I got to see prayer. I got to see the habit of prayer. But what taught me how to pray was this. This portion of scripture, Jesus taught me how to pray. I saw the example living out in my parents. But the simplicity of the word of God is what taught me how to pray. Jesus says, when you pray, go into your room and close the door. Some versions say, go into your prayer closet. Go into your closet and shut the door. I was and still am very literal when it comes to the word of God. And so I began to pray when I was around 21 years old in my closet. And my roommate in college, she knew that I was praying because she would come into the door that we shared a bedroom and she would come in and she would see all of my shoes were pushed out into the middle of the floor and my closet door was closed. Now, if I'm going to pray, I have to push all of Ryan's shoes (laughs) into the, (laughs) for those of you that are here for the very first time, my husband has a very vast collection of shoes. But going into the prayer closet and shutting the door and and getting alone with the Lord began this communion time with me and God. I think the reason why God desires for us to go to a place and go alone, it doesn't mean that we don't pray in church. But that communication that we have with the Lord is because there is a place where I can mentally go back to where I have met with God, 
where it has just been me and the father. Every time we would move to a new home, if Ryan and I were moving, I would walk through the house and I would ask the Lord, where is my place to meet with you? Lord, help me find that place to meet with you. I, I, I love the place that I meet with the Lord because I've understood throughout years of prayer that in that place, I don't always get an answer. See, I think sometimes our expectation of God in prayer is that when we go to that place of prayer, we're going to get an answer. Sometimes we get a yes, and sometimes we get a no, and sometimes we get nothing. But I've never left my place of prayer without receiving his peace. And so when I would walk outside of that closet or walk outside of that place and I was faced with the same situation, the same circumstance that I went in there to pray about, even though the answer wasn't in front of me, I brought his peace with me. What prayer does for us, even though sometimes it doesn't give us the answer that even we want, sometimes God does say no. And how much more do we need his peace when we want a yes and he says no? And so when fear and doubt and anxiety and questions start to come because the circumstance hasn't changed, the remembering of the peace, God, you've got this. This belongs to you. You met me in the prayer closet. And you're the same God in there that you are out here. Jesus says, when you pray, don't pray to be seen. Pray to the Father that you don't see. And the Father that is unseen will reward you because of the secret place. The expectations that we put on ourselves in prayer is that it's got to be theologically, you know, it, it needs to be in the King James version. God, I don't, I don't have all the words. Listen, I have all the words, but my words aren't right. Can I tell you that some, sometimes people need to pray, God, give me the words, and sometimes there's some of us that we need to pray, God, um, Keep me from the words. God, I have too many words. Can you take away some of my words? And as we look at this prayer that Jesus is telling us here, he tells us that we need to pray alone in the quiet place and begin to have a conversation with the Father. Verse 7 says, when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. When I tell you every time I read something in scripture where it talks about somebody who has a lot of words, it's not a good thing. And can I tell you, I have a lot of words. I don't want to just babble on. I want my words in prayer to have purpose behind them. Verse 8 says, don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So this morning's message is going to be very, very practical. It's going to be very, very hands-on. How do we do this? If you have just gotten saved, listen, your prayer life with your creator is so important for your everyday life. If you, like me, have been saved for a number of years, I got saved when I was five and I'm about to celebrate, well, I'm getting close to, to hitting a new decade. 
I still need to be reminded of the simplicity and the importance of prayer. So what was Jesus trying to teach us? What does the Father expect from us in our communication, in our prayer life with him? Well, let's continue to look at this passage. Turn to Matthew 6, and we're going to start in verse 9. Because Jesus tells us here how we need to pray. Verse 9 says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. A couple things here. Jesus didn't say you should pray this prayer, which you can. But he said this is how you should pray. He gives us a blueprint and a, a, a set of how we pray. And the first thing we need to do, and we need to understand that we are praying to God, and he is our father. We are praying to the creator of the universe. Jesus says, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. There is none other holy but him. And even in the midst of the sovereignty of our God, the greatness of our God, the one that scripture says that the mountains are his footstool, that God is our Father, our Father who art in heaven. Holy is your name. Jesus starts this prayer not with the sovereignty of God, which he says it, holy is your name, but with the relationship that we have with God, which is he is our father. The next chapter over, in, still in this sermon, Jesus says to his disciples, if you being wicked and human know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will our Father who is in heaven give good gifts to his sons and daughters? The first thing Jesus tells us is that we as believers, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we become part of the family of God, and we are sons and daughters of the creator of this universe. He is our Father, and if we desire to give good gifts to our children. How much more does our heavenly father desire to bless us? Understanding that when we pray, we're not praying to a ceiling. We're not praying to some unobtainable, un, un, unable to, to commune with some force out there in a great vast beyond. We are praying to our father who loved us so much that he gave his only son for us, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We pray to a father that loves us so much that he desires to look at us as sons and daughters. Our problem is, is we relate our heavenly father to our earthly fathers. How many, how many dads do we have out there right now? Oh, okay. If it had been the moms, how many moms do I have out there? Oh, like, those hands are like, that's me. Dads are like, eh. <laughs> is, she, is she still talking? I'm still, in, I'm still in a comatose from all the barbecue this week. Our difficulty is we relate our heavenly father with our earthly father. And you may have had a great earthly father. I had a great earthly father. He was still imperfect. He still hurt me. He still didn't respond every time the way he was supposed to. 
I mean, my mom always laughs. She, th- she t- every family is dysfunctional. Every family needs therapy because we're human. We're imperfect. And our problem is, is we, we look at our heavenly father like our earthly fathers. And he is perfect. There is nothing lacking in him. He is so loving and compassionate, yet can still correct us. And he has everything that we need. Our father who is in heaven, holy is your name. The second thing we need to do is we need to know that it is his way and not our way. Friends, we could stop right here and spend six months on this right here. Because I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I go into prayer, especially when it's about my children or my husband, I already have a plan. I have steps one through 110 of how God needs to fix the issues in my family. Because like I said, we are all dysfunctional. The pastors, listen, I love how transparent we are. My kids have always been like, Mom, we should do a reality TV show. I said, absolutely not, because your father would not have a job. (laughs) But I go into the prayer closet, into the place where I begin to speak to my heavenly father about the needs that I have here, and I go with my plan, how I want him to fix it. And Jesus says, it's not our way, it's his way. He modeled this for us right before he went to the cross. In the garden, his whole purpose for coming to earth was to save humanity, to be the second Adam, to come and to to fix what Adam and Eve had destroyed, what sin had messed up to take the heel of his foot and crush the head of our enemy. And in that moment, right before Jesus is carried away, he looks at the father and he's in such anguish because he's about to go to an execution, a crucifixion that was brutal, But more than that, him and his perfection, he was about to take on all of the sin of humanity. And he knew what David said in the Psalms, where the prophetic Psalm came out that said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew in a moment he was going to be separated from his heavenly father that he had never been separated from before because what separates us is sin. And in that moment, Jesus asked God for a different plan. Father, if there's any other way, I've been here for 33 years. This is the whole reason why I came. But if there's any other way, please let this plan, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. This is hard. This is difficult. When we get into our prayer closet and we acknowledge God as our father, but then we acknowledge his sovereignty and his wisdom and his purpose and his plan, and we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as you have written it and ordained it, 
as you have planned it, the plans you have made in heaven, let them come here. That is not an easy prayer, my friend. But can I tell you, it's not just the good plan, it's the God plan. His ways, his purpose, not our own. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The next verse says this, Jesus is praying and he says, give us today our daily bread. Jesus is, is marking out for us this blueprint of prayer. He's our father. He has a, a purpose. He has a kingdom. And we want that here on earth. Give us today everything that we need. But Jesus was specific. Give us today our daily bread. I love this because sometimes when you pray, do you pray about today's needs or do you pray about tomorrow's? See, there, there's another portion of scripture where Jesus says that tomorrow has enough problems for itself. Don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about today. If you're going to be concerned about something, be present in today. Give us today our daily bread. Of course, when I, when I read this this week, I was like, that daily bread that I'm asking for, and I'm not even joking, before I go into Publix, because everybody buys the sourdough bread that's sliced, and I get there, and there's no bread left. Give us today the sourdough Publix bread that is pre-sliced. So good. Give us today our daily bread. What do you need today? The practical. Not tomorrow. Not this big, huge, Lord, give me, give me influence. Give me, give me a platform. Give me this. Give me. No, give me today exactly what I need. My daily bread. When we make things more complicated and we don't make prayer simple, we begin to miss that daily communion that God has for us, that desire for us. Give us today our daily bread. The fourth thing is this. We must admit that we need forgiveness. Matthew 6, 12, give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts. There's something about going to the Father and admitting you've messed up. If anybody that you can go to and be real about your sin, it's the one that created you. The one that saw the sin thousands of years before you ever did it. He knew your sin. He saw in his omniscience, he saw your sin. And he sent his son to die for that sin. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins. Forgive us our debts. We have to admit on a daily basis that we need forgiveness. Why? Well, it reminds us who he is. And then it also helps us to forgive those who have sinned against us. Jesus said, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. When we have an acknowledgement of the sin in our life, it's really hard not to forgive others for the sins that are in theirs. Forgive us our debts. 
I love the first Sunday of the month. I love taking communion together. But I love this moment, not out of tradition and rotation. We, we, we have an order. First Sunday of the month, we take communion. And yes, it could get monotonous and habitual. But can I tell you whether I'm up here or down there? When I begin to hear the story of the brokenness of his body, I reflect on where I was before and where he brought me to today. When I, today, when I drank that juice that represented his blood, I sat there and said, by his stripes, I am healed. The remembrance of what he's done for us. We have to admit that we need forgiveness, that we needed a savior And it should be so fresh on us that it does bring tears to our eyes. If you're going to cry about anything, allow your emotion, allow your heart to be moved by your Savior and what he's done for you. So why is prayer important? Jesus gave us This blueprint on how to pray. This is how you pray. Why do we need to do it? Why is it important? Verse 13 says this. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We have an enemy on this earth that used to be in heaven. He was a worship leader of heaven and and now he's been cast out of heaven and is causing chaos here on this earth. As we begin to pray and have kingdom conversations with our heavenly father, we begin to recognize the temptation and the evil one. Why is prayer so important? Why did Jesus add this at the end of his prayer? And lead us not into temptation. God doesn't tempt us. He tests us. James talks about a a testing that happens to perfect our faith and our character, but Jesus is telling us, as you're praying, ask the Lord not that that path won't lead you into a a temptation, but a deliverance from the evil one. Heavenly Father, deliver us from the plans of the enemy. Deliver us from the things that would so easily trip us up and cause us to stumble and to fall. Samuel Chadwick said this. The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He laughs at our toils. He mocks our wisdom. But trembles when we pray. The power of prayer is not from the words that you speak, but it is the connection that you have with your heavenly father that you begin to grow your faith and your belief in him. And demons begin to tremble when the people of God hit their knees and begin to say, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done. Because the Father's kingdom is that our children are saved. The Father's kingdom is that this nation is made whole. 
The Father's kingdom is that everyone would accept Christ, that everyone would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's the Father's will. And so when you and I begin to pray, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done. Change my desires to be your desires. Give me the desires of your heart. Heavenly Father, you help me to be an example and to be a light in a dark place. Lord, don't change my job that I'm having struggles with. Make me a lighthouse at my job that I'm having struggles with. When we begin to change our prayers and we say, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth the enemy of our souls begins to tremble because he understands the power behind that prayer will change this world 12 people 12 men changed the course of this world oh what would happen if in the city of Tallahassee, a church of almost 800 became men and women of prayer, oh, friends, forget about this city and that capital being changed. We could change this world, not for us, but for him. Prayer is so important, my friend. Prayer is so needed in our nation. This is not my notes. We need to pray that the division that the enemy is desiring to bring into this nation will not enter the doors of our churches. I don't care if you vote red, blue, or purple. I don't care. Will we be a, a church that it's not about our vote that we cast, but it's about the kingdom that we belong to? That we allow our hearts to be healed. that we don't allow racism to walk through these doors. Can we shut out the noise of this nation that is dying and going to hell and come around the only common goal? And that's Jesus and his kingdom and his life and to live it more abundantly. Friends, that will happen as we begin to pray. Hey, thank you so much for watching today's video. Hey, do me a favor really quick before you log off. Make sure you click that subscribe button below so that you can stay in the loop of new videos and new content coming out. Also, feel free to comment below what the big item or big topic was that impacted you the most today. And also, feel free to share these videos and our YouTube channel all together so that others can benefit from the amazing messages and content that we're creating. For any and all other information that you might need about service times, locations, and our church at large, make sure you visit www.transformtlh.com. Dot com. Hey, have a great day and God bless you.